Um, so this morning, um, I want to, as we look in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I want to talk to you today about um, the danger of idols, okay? The danger of idolatry. Why shouldn't I just do what I want to do? Um, you know, the mindset the attitude that many people, most people, I should say, in our world today have towards life is, it's my life, I'll do what I want. Amen? Isn't that the attitude? That's the attitude that, that most have uh, here in America. Even as believers, we know that we are supposed to follow the Lord and we're supposed to follow what God wants us to do. However, oftentimes we still do what we want to do instead. Amen? Amen? Or we pass that off as what God wants us to do. Um, unfortunately, oftentimes we put other things in place or in a higher priority in our lives um, than God. And sometimes we just we don't even think it's really that big of a deal. Whether it's sports, listen, I think we guys we've all been guilty of that, right? Whether it's uh, an organization or a club that you maybe put too much. Uh, importance on. It can even be things like our cell phone, social media, uh, even uh, abstract things like uh, approval and success, things that we elevate to such a point in our lives where they become idols in our lives. And then we rationalize it. We rationalize that and say, well, well, God knows how I feel about him. Um, you know what? It's just really not that big of a deal. It's not that big of a deal. This is just something I like to do. Uh, listen, God, God wouldn't want me to give this up because God, God wants me to be happy. And so in our minds, it's not a big thing. But in reality, it's a bigger deal than what we realize. Because, friends, these things oftentimes unknowingly take over our lives and become a thing unto themselves. Uh, and, and sometimes even end up consuming us. Most people that have made an idol out of something oftentimes don't even realize that they've done that. So I want us to look this morning in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Let's start in verse 14. In verse 14, Paul says this, and he gives us just a simple command. It's a great follow-up to what, <clears throat> what he said before this. He said, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Um, last week he talked about the fact that, you know, let him who thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. You know, a lot of times we think that can't affect me. You know what? I'm, I'm stronger than that. It's not a, it's not something that's going to affect me. There's, you know, I can handle it, but no temptation, as he says in verse 13 is overtaken you except such is a common demand, right? And so even though we know God won't allow us to be tempted beyond what we are able friends, Paul encourages us, in fact, commands us here in verse 14 to flee from idolatry. Now, we know that idolatry was a problem the Israelites had, right? The Old Testament, man, we've studied that. We looked at Judges. We looked at other books in the Old Testament. And we have seen that the Israelites, even though the first commandment, God says, you shall have no other gods before me, right? The Israelites had a problem with that over and over and over and over again. Um, they had a problem with idolatry. But Pastor, we don't have a problem with idolatry, right? Uh, we hear the word idolatry and we think, we think little statues, right? We think, um, I don't bow down to foreign gods. For, so we think that this doesn't apply to us when Paul says flee from idolatry. Friends, but here's the reality. The reality is there are many things in our lives that can become idols. Tim Keller uh, stated in his book, Counterfeit Gods, listen to what he says. He says, an idol is anything that is more important to you than God. Anything. Now, I know all of us would probably, no, there's nothing more important to me than God, Pastor. We would say that, wouldn't we? But listen to the next two things he says. He says, it's anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God. Okay. And anything that you seek to give you only what God can give. So friends, an idol can be anything that we place so much importance on that it rises to that position 
um, where it's just of premier importance in our lives. Now, yes, there are... We think of idols as Old Testament things, but there are literal idols in the world today, okay? I don't know if, you know, even here in America now, especially in countries where Buddhism and Hinduism are, um, are heavy influences, um, people, a lot of people have literal idols that they place um, in their homes and in uh, their, their temples and so forth. In fact, I don't know if you've ever been into somebody's home here in America, um, where that, that's maybe a Hindu or Buddhist, and they have a shrine um, that where they have literal idols at. I've seen that myself. Um, but even though there are there are still literal idols, um, many of us here in America would say that's that's not a problem, friends. But the reality is, we make idols out of so many things. Celebrities. How many celebrities do we put to? We have a show called what? American Idol. Um, sports stars. Uh, uh, some make idols. Listen, some people make idols out of the disciples, out of the mother of Jesus, out of saints throughout history. People make idols of these things, of these, these people. Listen, many people idolize and worship technology. So much so that, you know, we're paying so much attention to that. We're not paying attention to, to the Lord. Some idolize ideas and philosophies. Health, wealth, success, education, some people idolize. Friends, we can even make idols out of our kids and our families. Family vacation can become an idol if we're not careful. Uh, these things, all of them are not bad in and of themselves, but when we place so much importance on them that that importance um, uh, supersedes God's importance in our lives, then they've taken a place of idolship in our lives. Now, so we know the Israelites had a problem with, with literal idols, and we have a problem making idols out of just about anything else. So as Paul has talked about this, and he's talked about idol worship, and he's talked about meat sacrificed to idols, um, we've talked about the fact that there was some ambiguity, right, about meat sacrificed to idols. And Paul told um, the Corinthians that, um, yes, you are free to eat that and so forth. But Paul wanted to make something very clear, even in talking about meat sacrificed to idols, and that was that idolatry itself was wrong. Putting anything in the place of or ahead of God is wrong. Idolatry in any form is a sin and is wrong. And so in our verses today, here in the middle of chapter 10, Paul gives us several reasons why. Several reasons why we need to make sure that we don't allow even idolatry of any sort to creep into our lives. So take a look at this with me, if you will. Let's take a look at your outline. Number one, first reason, Paul says that it's dangerous to put other things before God. There's danger. Idolatry is dangerous as this, friends. It is because idolatry harms our fellowship with Jesus and his church. Idolatry harms our fellowship with Jesus and his church. So as Paul has said in verse 14, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Verse 15, he says this. He says, I speak as to wise men. Judge for yourselves what I say. In other words, listen, if you have any wisdom about you, listen, listen to what I'm saying and judge for yourselves whether this is something you should pay attention to. Verse 16, he says this. He says, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? Now, let me pause there for just a minute. Um, the cup of blessing is a phrase that we may find a little unusual, may not really say, what is he talking about there, pastor? We may not understand that. Um, the cup of blessing was the proper name given to the third cup during the Passover feast. So at Jesus's uh, and the disciples, when they celebrated the, Jesus's last Passover, when they were in the upper room and they celebrated Passover together, it was that third cup, the cup of blessing in the Passover that Jesus used and passed around as a symbol and said, this cup is what is uh, the new covenant in my blood. Okay. So Jesus used this as a symbol for his blood that would be shed for us. So as Paul 
writes here, the cup of blessing which we bless, and which we partake of, which we give thanks for, uh, and we uh, take part in, he says, is it not the communion, or the, the word means the fellowship, the sharing of the blood of Christ? Then he, the second half, he says, the bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? So Paul here is referencing something, one of the two ordinances of the church, which is, we call it communion or the Lord's Supper, right? And so he, as he talks about this, he's using uh, kind of that as an illustration of the connection that we have with Christ. And he says, listen, as we partake of the Lord's table, what Christ initiated for us to remember his sacrifice for us, when we partake of the cup, we are fellowshipping, connecting, sharing in the blood of Christ, okay? Now, this is not some mystical thing. This is just a a matter of saying when we participate in that and when we take of that, what we are saying is that I'm believing in the blood of Christ, which is symbolized by this, this, this juice, that I'm believing that that atones for my sin. The bread which we break, is it not? So the body and the bread, the juice and the body. So Christ's body and blood shed for us, paid for our sins. Amen? So when we um, participate in the Lord's Supper, which here at the end of chapter 11, we're going to be coming to Paul talking more about that, and we'll be observing that as we do often um, times as, here as a, as a church family. But he's saying we identify with that. We, connect, we are proclaiming our faith in the body and blood of Jesus as the payment and sacrifice for our sins. Amen? Amen. And so we are remembering and identifying his de- what his death did for us. So I have um, consulted and um, have some very complicated diagrams for you this morning um, that I have drawn on, drawn on my computer. Um, thank you all for realizing the humor in that. Um, I actually, um, I just thought that it would be easier for me to draw it than to have Stephanie <laughs> take this and make a computer drawing. So you have it as a, as a hand drawing, okay? But I wanted to illustrate something for you. I know it's a little bit dark, so I hope you can see it. Um, but simply, if, if we have this circle here representing Jesus' body and blood, which was shed for us, here we are as a believer. When we participate in uh, the Lord's table, um, remembering his body and blood that was shed for us, we identify with Jesus' body and blood. And therefore, what Paul is saying here is we have what? Uh, is it not the communion or the fellowship of the body and blood of Christ? So when we do that, we are connecting with Christ, okay? And we are in good fellowship with him. We've trusted him as our savior. We are at the Lord's table professing our faith in him, okay? So um, now look at verse 17. So he takes it here that on, on, from an individual level, as we just saw, In verse 17, he says this, for we, though many, okay, so here he takes it from us individually connecting um, through the Lord's table. We, though many, he's talking about all of us, right, are one bread and one body. Notice the emphasis on a number, the number one, right? He says, for we all partake of that one bread. So for we, though many, are one bread. In one body, we all partake of that one bread. So the emphasis is on one, that we together, when we connect to Christ, we all become one people connected to him and therefore connected to each other. Amen? What is the one bond that we have together that is mostly, if you're a member of this church particularly, why we're here this morning. There's only one reason, right? It's because of what Jesus has done for us. That's what connects us together, okay? Whether you've already accepted that or you're here to kind of find out about that, that's what connects us. But as believers, as we've accepted him, so let's take a look. I've got another wonderful, fantastic drawing um, that I found somewhere, Um, Okay, so now we've taken it from uh, the individual level. Okay, same thing, 
this circle representing Jesus' body and blood, and each believer is now connected here to Christ, right? And I think you can probably already see what I'm trying to illustrate with this is because each of us is connected to Christ here. We are also connected. Let's see the next slide. Nope, nope, too far. Next, nope, there we go. To each other, right? And so that is what bonds us. What bonds us is our salvation, our faith in Christ. And so we all become one body in Christ. Amen? As we have fellowship with the Lord, okay? And our fellowship with the Lord also gives us fellowship with one another. Here's the problem. Because we're talking about this and our fellowship and our connection and all that. Pastor, but today we're talking about idolatry. So how, what's the connection here? What, what are you trying to say? Friends, here's the problem. When we put something else in Jesus' place in our lives, or someone, or something, whatever it is, we put something else, we make something else an idol in our lives, friends, um, then we, in essence, are harming our fellowship with him. And not only with him, take a look at the next, our, the next wonderful diagram here. Okay, so when we make something else an idol in our lives, we are, we are pulling away from the identification with Christ. And listen, if you've been saved, your salvation is not what we're talking about here. Okay, um, but we are pulling away from that and we are therefore causing damage and harm to the, not only to the body of Christ as far as our fellowship with Christ himself, but also to the body of Christ as a whole. So any kind of idolatry harms our fellowship with Christ and his church. Amen? But that's not all. Look at number two. Why is idolatry dangerous? It's dangerous not only because it harms our fellowship with Christ and his church, friends, but second, because... And before I, put the, before I fill in the blanks, let me say this. There is something Paul tells us here, okay? This is so important. I, I want you to just stay zoned in right here. There is something behind idolatry um, that is very dangerous, okay? Satanic forces are what's truly behind idolatry in our lives. Look at verse 18. I want to explain what I'm talking about and let us, let us flesh this out. Verse 18, Paul writes this. He says, observe Israel after the flesh. Now that's a little bit of an odd way to, to put it in English, but that's the literal translation from the Greek. But here's what it means. It simply means consider physical Israel. Okay, consider the nation of Israel or the people of Israel. In other words, Paul's saying, think back to Old Testament times. He says, are not those who eat of the sacrifices partakers or participators of the altar? So he's saying, think about physical Israel and the way they did things in the Old Testament with all the sacrifices and so forth, for their, atoning for their sins, all that. The, the, Israel, the Jewish sacrificial system. He said, are not those who participate in that participating in the altar? Okay. In other words, those who participated in that sacrificial system in the Old Testament, were they not affirming their belief in and their devotion to God and, and him as, um, their, as their God? Right? That's what they were doing as they participated in that sacrificial system. They were proclaiming their belief in God and his ways. So what Paul is saying here is, likewise, any sacrifice made to any idol is also identifying with and affirming devotion to that idol as well. Now, he's referring to what the Corinthians ran into, idol worship there in Corinth, okay? So remember what some people were saying was that um, it didn't, you know, that they could eat meat sacrificed to idols. It didn't matter at all, right? Paul was saying you need to be careful because when the Gentiles, when the Corinthians who aren't a part of the church are sacrificing things to idols, um, 
They are participating in what is, and they are proclaiming their belief in whatever that idol stands for. But I know what some people would, would respond to that. But pastor, didn't Paul just say a couple of chapters ago that an idol was nothing? Right? So look at what he says next in verse 19. He says, what am I saying then? That an idol is anything? Or what is offered to idols is anything? Uh, he knew that they would bring that up. And so the, even the way he phrases that, the answer is no. Right? Paul's already answered this. He's not he's saying, listen, the idol's not anything. The, 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 the idol itself, there's, it's a false god. It's just a, a statue. It's just a representation of, 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 of a god that doesn't exist, of course. He says, rather, in verse 20, that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. So I want you to listen to me very carefully here. What he's saying is the idols or the things sacrificed to the idols, correct. They have no spiritual nature in and of themselves. They have no spiritual power because they're not real gods. They, they are just a statue or a, a picture or whatever the idol is that somebody is pretending is a God to worship to. So Paul acknowledges that. He says, however, he says, there is something very real, if you will, behind that idol. There's something very real and very powerful behind those fake idols. And what that something very real is are demonic or satanic forces. So let me clarify so that hopefully there's no confusion, okay? What Paul is saying is that an idol itself is nothing, right? In other words, the idol or, or the God is not real because there is no other God other than one Yahweh, amen? There is no other God. So the idol itself is not real, he says, but what is, is masquerading behind the idol is real, is something, and that is or are demonic, satanic forces. You with me? Yes? No? Yes. Okay. So what does he say about that at the end of verse 20? He says, and I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. So really what he's saying is, you may not even realize this, he says, but behind the idols that I, would, I agree with you are really nothing, there are satanic forces working and drawing you away from the one true God and d causing you to give your allegiance to these idols that are really nothing. Now, some of you may be saying, uh, and maybe may be thinking, say what, pastor? <laughs> I understand. You say, did you say what I think you said? Yes, I did. And so did Paul. What does Paul mean, pastor, that demons are behind idolatry? Well, I just said that, that there are, even though the idols are nothing, that there are satanic forces, demons um, behind the idols um, masquerading as, as things in order to draw us away from God. Uh, pastor, what is a demon anyway? Let's talk about that for just a minute. Um, I came across a kind of a good description here, and so I'm going to kind of walk through some things here. Uh, Danny Aiken, pastor, author, commentator, um, uh, seminary president, defines demons as this. And probably the most basic definition is this. Demons are fallen angels who fell with Satan or Lucifer, as his name was, um, in his rebellion against God before the world began. Okay? So if you'll remember, uh, Scripture tells us in a couple of places that um, Lucifer was, was, one, was an angel, um, and, and so he um, wanted to be God, and so he rebelled against God himself, and as a result of that, got kicked out of heaven, along with a third of the angelic realm, who are that now follow him, if you will, um, and he is, they are under his control, and he is their leader, and so Satan is a fallen angel. He used to be an angel, isn't it? kicked out of heaven because of his rebellion against God. And the demons are simply fallen angels also that follow him. 
and are under his power and his control. Now, according to scripture, uh, some demons are confined under judgment. They are bound until final judgment. While there, but there are others that roam free and um, are doing things such as what Paul is talking about here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Demons are powerful, but here's the thing. They are not, and here's what we often even think about this as Satan. They are not omnipotent. They're not all powerful. They are not all ni- uh, omniscient. They're not all knowing, and they're not omnipresent. They cannot be everywhere at, at one time as God can. Now, some believe that demonic activity uh, may have increased during the time of Christ, and that it may increase again um, at the end of the age. D- demons can do and do do such things as promote disunity. Okay, uh, I'm not going to ask how many of you have been part of a church before in which has, there has been um, problems and disunity. Uh, let me just tell you, anytime that is going on, some way, somehow, okay, um, the the demonic realm is behind that. Okay. Because that is not what um, Christ calls us to as his church. But not only do they promote disunity, they promote false doctrine. They promote false worship. They can even cause uh, mental difficulties. We see that in scripture. And um, they, they work to hinder Christian growth. Here's the thing. They can oppress us as Christians, but they cannot possess Christians. And so you're saying, oh, pastor, I don't, I don't know. I don't want to be possessed by a demon or something. Listen, if you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, there's only one that possesses you, and that's the Holy Spirit of God. Okay? And so the way to get rid of Satan in your life is to surrender to Christ and allow him to fill your presence and allow him to work in you. And so as Paul says here, they are often behind um, idolatry. They use idolatry in many shapes and forms to deceive people. And to promote false worship of false gods, whether they are literal um, physical idols or whether they are idols that we make up. Because here's the deal, friends. If demons, if Satan can keep people uh, worshiping something else, guess who they are not worshiping? God. If Satan can make us so, so passionate about some cause out there that is not Jesus and his cause, then guess what? And it may even be a good cause. But if Satan can keep us over here, focused over here, because listen, once you're saved, there's nothing Satan can do to take you away from God. Okay? Once God has redeemed you and you've responded in faith to him, you are a child of God, there is absolutely nothing he can do to take that away from you. But here's what he can do. He can do everything he can and will to make, render you ineffective in service to the Lord. And so if he can get you distracted, guess what? He's going to do that. And if he can get you to put something else in the place of God under your life, guess what? He's going to do that because once he does that, then he can go over and work on all these other things, okay? So why are idols and idolatry and putting other things above God so dangerous? Friends, it is because that is one very powerful way in which Satan and his cohorts use to deceive people and to keep them from following and worshiping the Lord as they are supposed to. If, they, if, if he can get people to follow after other things and put something else first in their life, then we will not follow the Lord as we should. Amen? Now, let me just say, friends, we need to be aware of this, okay? Um, I understand as Christians sometimes, um, people fall to one of two extremes. Either they don't believe that demons and the demonic realm exist at all, or they take an unhealthy interest in it. I want you to listen to something C.S. Lewis said. Um, Because, listen, this is very clearly what Paul is. You can't read this passage, okay, and take the scripture as the word of God and not understand. This is what Paul is saying, that the demonic realm is using idols and and things in our lives to pull us away from Christ, okay? Listen to what uh, what C.S. Lewis said. He said, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race, the human race, can fall about the devils or the demonic realm. He said, one is to disbelieve in their existence. He said, the other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. He says, they themselves are equally pleased by both errors. 
and hail a materialist or a magician with the same delight. Friends, I think it behooves us to listen to what C.S. Lewis says, to listen to what the Apostle Paul says, and understand the danger that idolatry can present in our lives and understand who is behind it. Number three. So, not only does idolatry harm our fellowship with Christ and his church, not only our satanic forces, what's truly behind idolatry in our lives. But the third reason, friends, idolatry is dangerous is because idolatry compromises our loyalty to the Lord. Idolatry compromises our loyalty to the Lord. So here in the last couple of verses, the apostle Paul brings it home, right? He Paul has warned us about what it means to partake of the Lord's table. He, he has talked about that the Lord's table symbolizes identification with Christ. It symbolizes fellowship with the Lord and with his body. And represents connecting with Christ, connecting with, with and embracing all that he is and all that he's done for us. Therefore, understanding that, look at what he says in verse 21. It's, there, there's not a therefore, but it's almost like a therefore here, okay? You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. Now, so he's talking to them literally, but to us kind of figuratively. So say you can't drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of the... You can't subscribe to what Jesus stands for and what the devil stands for. He says, uh, you cannot partake of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. Why, friends? Because they are complete opposites, Amen. One is, um, one is self-focused, you know, the devil wants you to just focus on yourself and do what you want to do. Listen, the philosophy of the world of America today is the devil's philosophy. Please follow your heart. Yes, that's what he wants you to do because that will lead you to hell. Follow your heart. His, his, he is focused on that. Friends, Christ is others focused. Amen. The very reason he came was not for himself, but was for us. Um, he says, you can't partake of both. They have different agendas. Friends, one seeks to give life. The other seeks to destroy life. One embodies holiness. That's Christ. Amen. The other perversity and rebellion. One represents light, one represents darkness, friends, and you can't embrace both. You can't dine with Jesus and the devil. And so when we put other things over the Lord, um, whether it is a literal false God or whether it's a God we've made and something in our lives that we've made into a God or made into an idol, friends, you can't serve both God and mammon. Amen? You can't do it. Reminds me of what Elijah said to the Israelites in 1 Kings chapter 18. I don't know if you remember that story. It's just before the battle um, Elijah had with the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. Do you remember that? Elijah um, told Ahab, uh, the king of Israel, they were worshiping foreign gods. They were worshiping Baal and Asherah and some of these foreign gods. They had many, many prophets, if you will. And Elijah said, bring all the prophets of Baal, bring the prophets of Ash, bring all the people of Israel here, and let's, let's once and for all, let, let's see who is the true God. But before all that went down, this first Kings chapter 18, I mean, I just love that story, but we're not going to talk a whole lot about that other than saying this, you, you can go this week, let that be some of your reading for this week. But as he brought all of Israel there, he said to Israel, as they were following foreign idols, how long, he said, will you waver or falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. Very simply put, he said, you determine for yourself. Friends, I think the same thing is, 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 is true for us today. Is Jesus who he said he is? Did he do what he said he did? Did he do what the Bible says he did? Is, was Jesus God in the flesh? If so, friends, then, then he, it demand, he demands our worship. Amen? He demands our allegiance. 
He demands our loyalty because of he is God Almighty. John chapter 1 tells us that he was not only there, but he participated. He was a part of creation, creating everything. And so he demands our worship. He demands our loyalty. So anything we put over him in our lives is idolatry. Um, think about it this way. If you started paying more attention to someone else than you did your spouse, okay, guys, if you started pay t- paying more attention and more time, spending more time with some other lady than with your spouse, would things go well for you? Absolutely not. Ladies, if you spent more time with another man than you did with your husband, what? That would, it, it would at the least bring into question whether you're loyal, where, whether your loyalty to them, right? And, and it would at the very least probably make them jealous as it should, And so, friends, the same thing is true here. When we elevate things in our lives to an importance level that they are more important to us than the Lord, we have made an idol out of whatever it is. Look at what verse 22 says. Verse 22, Paul says, Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Friends, this reminds me of the the first commandment, which you already talked about, and the second, which says this, um, you shall have no other gods before me. That's the first one, right? Look at the second one. It says, you shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the world. So let me, let me pause there for just one second and say, not only should we, do we, are we not supposed to make idols of other things, but we're not even supposed to make idols of things and even pretend that they are God. Let me tell you something. Maybe you don't even know this. You know, remember when, I think last week we talked about maybe a week before, but do you remember when after Moses went up on the mountain to receive the 10 commandments and the Israelites were down below and they got, you know, I don't know how long, we don't know how long Moses was up there, but it was for a while and they got, they got, they got bored. Okay. And it was a while, and they, they got a little tired and so forth. And they told Aaron, they said, hey, make for us a God, that, and we'll worship that God. So what, when they made that golden calf out of all the earrings, they made that golden calf as a representation, in their minds, they thought, of the one true God. But, but it wasn't. And so what God is saying here is, don't even make some representation Okay, that's why we need to be careful. And, uh, okay, I'm, some of you are going to do this right here. We got to be careful about what we wear and all these things that we don't start looking to that as a re- even a representation of God. God is spirit and we worship him in spirit and in truth. We don't need anything to represent him. He is so much greater than anything he can be in, confined to here on earth. And so the, the scripture is telling us here, you shall not make a carved image, in, even in something in a representation of him. Let's go to the next verse. It says, you shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a what? Jealous God. Now, I don't want you to think of God like your old jealous girlfriend, okay? God's not, oh, please come back to me. Uh, that's not it, okay? That's not what we're talking about here. But here's what we're talking about, friends. God demands our allegiance. Now, I, I know what that sounds like. That sounds very selfish on God's part, okay? So listen, I've already, a couple times I've told you, focus, hone in right here, okay? It sounds selfish, but it's not. Here's why it's not. It's not selfish, but God demands our allegiance because he is the one and only true God. He is the only, there is no other God other than him. So he knows that when we are worshiping an idol, We are not only worshiping a false God, one that does not really exist, friends, but he also knows that we are being deceived by and worshiping the devil himself when we're worshiping something else other than him. So in reality, God is not selfish. He just has our best interests at heart because he knows that anything else is really nothing. We're worshiping, might as well be worshiping air. Some people do. Okay, but he is the only one who really cares about us. And here's the thing, can really do anything for us anyway, such as 
give us eternal life. Amen? Everything else is empty and fruitless. So the question is, are we going to continue to do what we want to do and put other things before God in our lives and make and let them become idols in our lives and thereby anger the Lord? Okay, now, the, now you're going to understand a little bit more. Remember last week in chapter 10 where Paul says all these things were written, what, for our example and for our warning. All the things about the Old Testament, when, when he talked about they, they, they became idolaters and they became uh, sexual immor- immorality. And some of them died, many, all of them, except for two, right, died in the wilderness because of it. They suffered the consequence of their own actions. They repped, repped, reaped. Reaped, they reaped what they sowed. So are we going to continue to do what we want to do, friends, or will we serve him and him alone? I love what Danny Aiken says about this. He says, remember this, he says, no demon, no idol died for you. Only Jesus did, amen? Only Jesus. And then we look at the very last part of verse 22. He says this. Are we stronger than he? In other words, friends, you cannot play fast and loose with your loyalty to God. What we need to remember is we are ants before an elephant in comparison to our mighty God. Unless we think we can do what we want to do and we'll get away with it and we can, you know what, nobody's going to tell me what to do and all that. Yeah, God gives us the freedom to do that. But God also gives us the freedom to reap what we've sowed. I, um, I want to close with a, a story that I believe illustrates this, of what can happen when we put other things in a, in a place where they shouldn't be in our lives. Kurt Steiner is currently the world's greatest stone skipper. How many of you skipped stones at the, at the river, right? Or at the lake? Yeah. I, I, you know, my boys, we love to skip stones, Okay. Kurt Steiner is currently the world's greatest stone skipper. Yes, you heard that right. He's a stone skipper. In fact, over the past 22 years or so, Kurt has won 17 stone skipping tournaments. In fact, one tournament in 2013, he threw a rock that skipped so many times, it actually, they said, defied science. Kurt has dedicated his entire life to stone skipping. He said it helps him deal with his depression, and he even claims that it can help us achieve inner balance. Anyway, however, his quest, friends, like any and every idol we worship, has cost him dearly. In part, Kurt's dedication, or worship as some may call it, to stone skipping has left him broke, divorced, And since the death of his greatest rival, adrift even from his stone-skipping peers. Now, as a middle-aged man with a growing list of aches and pains, he contemplates the reality that he throws stones not simply because he wants to, but because he has no other choice. 2017, Kurt and his wife got divorced, primarily because his dedication to stone-skipping often took precedence over his dedication and loyalty to her. Ladies, at least your husband's not skipping stones, amen? (laughs) Here's what he said about that. He said, stone skipping rewards me in the way that it makes me forget, in the way that it gives me hope. Stone skipping makes me happy. Marriage, he says, was just too much of a puzzle for me. For Kurt, his love and dedication for stone skipping took precedence over everything else. And friends, the reality is it became an idol in his life. It compromised his love and loyalty to his wife, friends, and in the end, destroyed his marriage. Here's the deal. If we're not careful, 
a very similar thing can happen to us. Things that we never, ever, ever intend to become idols in our lives may just do that. Friends, and in the process, may destroy the very things that we truly love. Anytime we put something else before God in our lives, remember, you are hurting, you are harming, maybe even potentially destroying your relationship with him. So I want you to think about a couple of things this morning as we close. Friends, what in your life have you elevated to a place where it has become an idol in your life? What in your life do you need to put in its proper place today? You know, I said this before. um, Many things that become idols aren't bad things in and of themselves. They're just things that we put place a level of importance on that is far beyond where they should be. And so maybe it's we need to get our priorities in line. You know, I know there are certain things for me that can be temptations for that. And every now and then, I just have to do a check and say, wow, you know what? I really love this hobby, but you know what? It's, It's becoming a little too important for me. Let's knock it down. I have to make some intentional choices so that it won't be. What do you need to do that for? What do you need to repent of that you've allowed to become something that it really should never be? Do you need to refocus your allegiance on the Lord Jesus today? Remember, he's the one who died for you. Amen? He's the one who's worthy of all our worship. Maybe you're here today and you need to turn from other things to the Lord for the very first time. Friends, God is standing there with his arms wide open. Listen, he knows that you've been headed down a road, putting other things before him, and he's been calling you to himself. Would you today say, yes, Lord Jesus, today. I commit myself to you. Lord, you've done everything for me. You come, you've died for me so that my sins can be forgiven. Today, Lord, I surrender it all to you. Let's pray.